Study Session 4 Ancient Greek Mind Aristotle When you have studied this session, you should be able to give three reasons why Aristotle rejected Plato's idea of philosopher king. Also give an explanation of the scientific and the natural realm according to Aristotle. And finally, describe the origin of the state according to Aristotle. Introduction Aristotle, a student of Plato, was another Greek philosopher of repute. He was a long-time associate of Alexander the Great. His thinking is completely different from Plato, and his political thoughts was presented to posterity through his politics. Aristotle argued that stability can be assured under any kind of regime, stating that all that is needed is good socialization agencies to socialize the people. He rejected the idea of philosopher king on the grounds that theory and practical are not the same thing. He also posited that good government can be achieved through moral discipline, practice, and experience. He then rejected the communism of wives and property and extreme unity. Aristotle saw the state as the highest form of human community for the attainment of the good life and the best form of government as polity. A short biography on Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC. Aristotle was born to Greek physician Nicomachus in Stagira in Thrace, about 384 BC. His family background, it is said, probably accounted for his interest in biology and natural classification. Aristotle was a student of Plato for nearly 21 years. He left for Athens to study in Plato's academy in 353 BC, mainly because it was the best available in the whole of Greece at the time. He was there until the death of Plato in 347 BC, when he left to reside with his former pupil, Hermes, who was then king of Assos in Asia Minor. When Hermes was killed, he fled to Mytilene, taking with him Pythias, Hermes' niece and adopted daughter as wife. In 342 BC, he was invited by King Philip of Macedonia to educate his son, Alexander, who later became Alexander the Great and was only 13 then. When later, Alexander embarked on his expedition in Asia Minor, Aristotle fled back to Athens in 334 BC and opened his own school of philosophy, the Lyceum, which he also headed for 12 years. But when anti-Macedonia party assumed power in Athens, an attempt was made to try Aristotle for impiety. And so he fled to Chalcis in Eribwa, where he died the same year. C. Sabin and Thorsen, 1973, and the World Book of Encyclopedia, 1993. Aristotle in focus. He was a student of ancient Greek philosopher Plato. He shared his teacher's reference for human knowledge, but revised many of Plato's ideas by emphasizing methods rooted in observation and experience. Aristotle surveyed and systematized nearly all the extant branches of knowledge and provided the first ordered accounts of biology, psychology, physics, and literary theory. In addition, Aristotle invented the field known as formal logic, pioneered zoology, and addressed virtually every major philosophical problem known during his time. Known to medieval intellectuals as simply the philosopher, Aristotle is possibly the greatest thinker in Western history, and historically perhaps, the single greatest influence on Western intellectual development. Aristotle and Plato in perspective. Aristotle 
was a student of Plato and a longtime associate of Alexander the Great. At this junction, the relevant question would be, to what extent does Aristotle's philosophy owe to the influence of either of these two great personalities? First is the influence of Plato. Basically, it is difficult to imagine two minds that are completely opposite like that of Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle is as down-to-earth and empirical as Plato is transcendental. The two are different, even in the styles of their thinking and speculating. Plato was not merely religious at bottom, but also typical with poetical insight in the treatment of politics. For sheer intuitive prophetic brilliance, it is doubtful that Plato has been surpassed or perhaps even equaled in all Western history. Aristotle, in sharp contrast, was a scholar, the researcher, and the empiricist. Aristotle's long association with Alexander and his long travels in Asia Minor must have accounted for the significant difference between him and Plato. Even then, there is little trace of such influence in Aristotle's work. Thus, even though Aristotle, like any other philosopher of classical times, wrote on virtually everything, ranging from politics to religion, ethics and metaphysics, etc., his position vis-à-vis -vis Plato is diametrically different. A few examples will suffice as we go on. The first example is Aristotle's rejection of Plato's basis of stability. Aristotle is as much concerned with the problem of order as Plato. But more even so, Plato states that order is best assured through a most rational organization of the polis in the form of an ideal republic and the proper integration of the individuals therein. However, Aristotle believes that stability can be assured under any regime, including tyranny. All that is required is appropriate institutions to perform the socialization functions. For instance, to ensure stability, Aristotle prescribes that the tyrant must avoid molesting the women and children of his subjects, and he must appear godly and moderate in his dealings. The second example is Aristotle's rejection of the idea of philosopher king. Aristotle disagrees completely with Plato's idea that philosophers should be rulers. The logic of his rejection is based on the fact that there is need to draw a clear distinction between the theoretical and practical exercise of reasoning. Scientific knowledge, he argued, applies only to what is necessary and universal, both of which are found in the realm of nature. These are the proper objects of theoretical knowledge. They do not apply in the realm of human affairs, which is a field of practical activity. Thus, while the theoretical knowledge of the philosopher gives him profound comprehension of the principle of the natural universe, it does not give him any special understanding of the principles which should govern man's conduct, and so, does not qualify its possessor to be a ruler. In short, mere theoretical knowledge of the principles and working of nature possessed by the philosopher is not adequate for dealing with the more uncertain practical, social, and political problems of everyday life. These, Aristotle believes, can be achieved through moral discipline, practice, and experience. Thirdly, Aristotle rejects communism, whether of property or of children. It is most unacceptable. The ground of this rejection is that what belongs to all does not evoke any feeling of love, friendship, care, or sympathy, which to him are essential basis of social stability. The idea of communism of children, in particular, is a major violation of this essential ingredient of the foundation of the state. The fourth example 
is Aristotle's rejection of extreme unity. To Plato, the greater the unity of the state, the better. Aristotle disagrees completely with this view. He firmly believes that extreme unity could be dangerous to the very existence of the state. Aristotle states thus, Is it not obvious that a state may at length attain such a degree of unity as to be no longer a state? Since the nature of a state is to be a plurality, intending to greater unity, from being a state, it becomes a family, and from being a family, an individual. For the family may be said to be more one than the state, and the individual than family, such that we ought not to attain the greatest unity, even if we could, for it will be the destruction of the state. See Convict, MR, and Morphe, AE, 1948. The nature of the police in Aristotle. Aristotle opens his politics with a discussion of the importance of the state or police. He sees the state as the highest form of community, whose main aim is for the attainment of the highest good. Origin of the state. To Aristotle, the origin of the state is natural, a logical extension of the family. And by extension, both are a product of the need for self-sufficiency. The family evolved from the individual's need for self-sufficiency. So does the state, because the family is incapable of achieving this self-sufficiency. But unlike both the individual and the family, it is only the state that is the police that is partly capable of attaining this self-sufficiency. The same physiological needs cause individuals to combine into villages and the villages into the state. From this, Aristotle concludes that the state is just as natural as the family. It is a natural process, not a departure from it. It is also a means of fostering and not of thwarting the development of man as an individual. Indeed, it is only the police that can give scope and exercise of reason. See Sabian and Thorson, 1973. This is how far Aristotle can go with Plato on the origin of the state. To him, the state has even a more fundamental purpose, which is the satisfaction of man's rational needs. The inadequacies of the family and the village are not limited to their inability to adequately satisfy the needs of man's animal nature, but also includes their inability to supply the needs of his rational nature as well. This need of his, according to Aristotle, can only be best supplied in politics, distinct from a purely economic society, and so man's rational need finds its highest development in politics as distinct from economic activity. Here lies Aristotle's dictum that man is a political animal. The fact that it is not just the economic need and its specialization functions as posited by Plato that accounts for the formation of the state. The purpose of the state. Aristotle states that the purpose of the state is for the good life, not just life only, According to him, if it were for only life, then slaves and brute animals would form a state. Slaves, of course, have no rights. Like animals, they cannot participate in politics because they have no share in happiness or in the life of free choice. Neither does the state exist solely for the purpose of exchange and mutual intercourse, nor for the sake of alliances against insecurity and injustice. If it were so, Aristotle argued, then the Carthaginians and the Tyrrhenians, that is the Etruscans, would have formed a state since they had a treaty of mutual commerce between them. The state too is not a mere society with a place for the prevention of crime, 
and for the mutual exchange. These are both conditions for the existence of the state. The state to Aristotle is a community of families and the aggregation of families in well-being for the sake of perfect self-sufficing life. The end of the police, therefore, is for the good life. Furthermore, the state does not exist merely for companionship, but for noble actions, for the production of a good and virtuous man. This, of course, is the ethical role of the state. It is the contention of Aristotle that the bad actions of a man, which do not infringe on the right of others, are as vicious as those that do. A state that only seeks to prevent infringement on rights, rather than in prevention of bad action in general, is only performing half its duty as a state. He further explained that to deter a criminal from committing a crime for fear of punishment is to leave the criminal as bad as it was before. In essence, a state which does not care for how good or bad its citizens are, so long as they do not commit crime, is not performing its proper duty. According to him, those who care for good government take into consideration virtue and vice in the state. Whence, it may further be inferred that virtue must be the care of the state or police, which is truly so called and not merely enjoys the name. See Confit and Murphy, 1948, and Sabine and Thorsen, 1973. The function of the state to Aristotle is thus total. It conflicts with the view of the latter philosophers of the liberal school. To Locke, the arch-liberal, for instance, the main function of the state is to protect the right of individuals against infringement by others. The individual is entitled to the security of his life and property and to liberty of actions provided such actions does not infringe upon the rights of others. The function of the state is also the preservation of these rights, the prevention of their violation by deterring any man from injuring his fellow in his property, person of freedom, and to punish where it is not successful in deterring. This, of course, is a highly limited conception of the role of the state. Classification of constitutions. From here, Aristotle tried to find the most ideally available constitution one that is likely to realize the purpose of the state, which is the good life. He reviewed the various existing constitutions, about 158 in all, and tried to identify the basis of their claim to political power. Such claims he found are made on behalf of one, the few, and the many. From these, he came up with these six major forms of government. 1. The claim to power on behalf of one can be either that of humane monarchy based on preeminent goodness or virtue or that of a tyrant based on force. Secondly, is the claim of the few, maybe that of a wealthy commercial minority, urging the right of the wealthy to rule. This is aristocracy which is seen as government by men of virtue. Conversely, it may be that of a hereditary landed aristocracy. He calls this oligarchy. And lastly, the claim of the many is the claim of number, that the free-born majority should control power. This he calls democracy. Aristotle does not take a stand on which is the best. He believes that each has merits and demerits. By combining the merits of oligarchy and democracy, Aristotle arrived at his sixth form of government, polity, which he thinks is the best, not only because of his moderation, but because of his stability too. 
Like aristocracy, it is a mean. To Aristotle, the primary cause of instability is psychological. That is the attitude of the mind, desires, etc. The desires include the desire for material gains, status and prestige, and fear, especially of disgrace or loss of prestige. He believes that revolutions are never made merely for material interest. In his view, any regime whose legitimating ideology is based on class support is potentially unstable. In that respect, he thinks democracy is more stable than oligarchy because the struggle is between the rich and the poor. In aristocracy, the struggle is within the wealthy and other contending classes, and so the struggle appears more vicious. After examining the general causes of instability, Aristotle also examines the primary or immediate cause of revolution, and they include 1. Unjust distribution of income and prestige, which tends to organize some groups. 2. The disproportionate growth in the number of a particular social class. And lastly, election intrigues, which can tip off the psychological causes of revolution. There could also be particular causes too, and they include division within the royal family, especially where the monarch has lost his moral authority. And secondly, in democracy, where extreme disappropriation of the wealthy might precipitate a revolution by the rich. See Sabian and Thorsen, 1973, and Convicts and Morphy, 1948. Aristotle also noted that the aim of a revolution may not necessarily be to achieve a total change. It may just be to control a government in which the entire machinery of government is left intact or just change the section of the constitution. In all of these, it is necessary to emphasize that the meaning of revolution in Aristotelian context is not the same as in our contemporary radical sense of total transformation. Condition for stability. For stability to occur, Aristotle says there must be adequate political education in the spirit of the constitution there must be institutions to perform the political socialization functions necessary for stability, even in tyranny. Summary Aristotle disagrees completely with Plato's idea that philosophers should be rulers. Scientific knowledge, he argued, applies only to what is necessary and universal, both of which are found in the realm of nature. He asserted that the origin of the state is natural, a logical extension of the family, and both are a product of the need for self-sufficiency. He came up with six major forms of government. Aristotle does not take a stand on which is the best. He only believes that each has its merits and demerits. For him, the primary cause of instability is psychological and he also believes that revolutions are never made merely for material interests. End of study session 4. Thank you for listening.